Lydia Day, expected to spend the evening of January 31, 1890, in quiet comfort at her home, which also served as a boarding school. The Comstock School, located at 32 West 40th Street in New York City, a prestigious finishing school for young ladies, was usually filled with the sounds of energetic young girls. But on this evening, the girls were at a concert by the New York Symphony and wouldn't be back until late. Miss Day began her evening in the third-floor sitting room with a good book. One student, Helen Potts, skipped the concert due to a bad headache. Helen was a beautiful, talented young lady, the daughter of wealth and privilege, who had led a sheltered life in the seaside town of Ocean Grove, New Jersey. A recent enrollee in the school, she was a demure young lady, who seemed to be well-liked by her fellow students, despite the fact that she was somewhat older than they. Helen was very cheerful that evening, as the two women alternately talked and read. Miss Day retired a little before 10 p.m., leaving Helen in the sitting room. Helen soon decided to go to bed herself. As she made her way to the communal bedroom on the fourth floor, Helen saw Miss Reed, the associate principal. Helen stopped Miss Reed and said, My young doctor friend has given me a prescription to cure my malaria. He says that I must take it just before going to bed and that I must not be awakened. If I wake up, he says, the medicine won't do any good. I wish you would warn my roommates not to wake me tonight when they come home from the concert. At 10.30 p.m., Helen's roommates, Francis Carson, Rachel Cookson, and Bertha Rockwell, arrived back at the school from the concert and went upstairs to go to bed. Miss Reed neglected to give them Helen's message. When they entered the bedroom, they found Helen asleep with the gaslight turned down. The girls turned the light up and began bustling around the room preparing for bed. The noise woke Helen. Girls, she said, I've had such wonderful dreams. I could dream on forever. I've been dreaming about Carl. The girls laughed as they continued to get ready for bed. Miss Reed came in and turned the gaslight off at 11 p.m., and about five minutes later, Helen began to moan. Francis Carson got out of bed and went to Helen. Helen complained of numbness, and Francis began to rub her head to comfort her. Helen began to have difficulty breathing and complained of a choking sensation. She said she felt as if she were going to die. The girls tried to reassure her that she was all right, but she repeatedly said she thought she was going to die. If you go to sleep, they told her, you would be better. Helen replied, if I go to sleep, it will be a death sleep. She urged them, should she go to sleep, to periodically check to see if she were still breathing. Carl said I could take one of these pills every night for twelve nights in succession, and he had taken them himself. Carl would not give me anything that would hurt me. Would he? The girls comforted Helen for approximately three-quarters of an hour. When it became apparent that Helen was worsening, they sent for Miss Day. When she arrived, Helen was unconscious. Rachel Cookson later testified that when the gaslight was turned back on, she looked like death. She was very pale, and the veins all stuck out on her forehead and were blue, and even her hands were blue. Miss Day wasted no time trying to revive Helen, but immediately sent for Dr. Edward Fowler, who lived three doors down from the school on 6th Avenue. No ordinary general practitioner, Dr. Fowler was an eminent physician, the author and editor of several medical books, and a founder of New York's homeopathic medical college. When Dr. Fowler arrived, he found Helen in a state of profound coma, with cold, pale blue skin and labored breathing. Her pupils were both contracted to a point almost beyond being perceptible. Fowler recognized the symptoms, which were all too common in Gilded Age New York City. Opiate poisoning, probably from an overdose of the opium derivative, morphine. During the Civil War, Union medical officers had liberally used morphine as a painkiller in the treatment of the horrific wounds inflicted by the 50 caliber mini-balls fired in the rifled muskets of the era. Because the addictive qualities of morphine were not fully understood, thousands of Union soldiers returned home hopelessly addicted to the drug. From this core of addicts, the abuse of the drug spread, until by the 1890s, morphine abuse was rampant. Sale of the drug was for the most part unrestricted, and it could be bought in many drugstores without a prescription. Over-the-counter painkillers often contained morphine, and the well-to-do morphine addict could easily obtain the drug from multiple sources. 